We look to you tonight to honor you, to honor you with our spirits. We want to worship you in spirit and truth. We want to hear from you and see you. So we ask, Lord, that you'd reveal yourself to each of us right where we're at. Lord, as we worship, may they see you. Lord, as we study your word, may they draw closer. May they want more of you, less of themselves. So, Lord, lead us tonight, we pray in your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Reign in our lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, it's our prayer, Lord. Bring in our lives, in our hearts, Lord, in our minds, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my
let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing.
Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain To receive all glory, power, and praise For with your blood you purchased us for God Jesus, you are worthy, that is what you are Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a precious child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain to receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us from God. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Perfect sacrifice. Crushed by God for us, bearing all our hurt, all that I deserve. We judged for my misdeeds, we suffered silently, the only guiltless man in all of history. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain to receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. 
Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. With mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely pay. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches. Beyond the stars in the sky Oh, love is deeper Than any ocean higher Than the heavens reaches Beyond the stars in the sky Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given for the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. Mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely pay. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher, than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars and the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Such a grace. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, your power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, 
how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art That God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great. When Christ shall come With shout of acclamation And take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And then proclaim My God how great you are then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are great. We love our great God because our great God first loved us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us while we were yet sinners. Christ died. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Zechariah. We're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 11 tonight, and I've titled the message, uh, The Messiah's Rejection. The Messiah's Rejection, Zechariah 11, verses 1 through 17. Let's open in prayer. Father, we sense your presence we feel your love, and we want to say we love you. But Lord, we want to learn to love you more and more. We want to love you the way you love us. Teach us to love as you love. Not only to teach us to love you, but to love our enemies, to love those around us, the unloving, the unkind, Lord, have your way in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 11, and chapter 11 is filled with, uh, again, a parable about shepherds. In, in God's flock, it's seen as being scattered and slaughtered because the shepherds were false shepherds. See, if there's, if there's true shepherds, and Jesus is that good shepherd, there's the opposite, always the counterfeit. Whatever God is doing, Satan is counterfeiting. In fact, we, we might not recognize even from the, the context and connect the passage again to the New Testament where, again, the betrayal of Christ by Judas Iscariot. 
Yet if it wasn't quoted in the New Testament, we probably never would have got it. You can make a note, Matthew 26, verse 15 and 27, and verse 9 through 10. See, all these things were foreshadowing the things that were to come, the things that were occur. Well, again, then uh, they are going to be, that is, again, Israel, again, delivered into the hands of a, a worthless shepherd. We're going to see that in verses 15 to 17. And, and, and that worthless shepherd is, a, is an antichrist, and it's going to be, uh, again, a picture, and, and, and most scholars believe that. There's some debate that uh, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD when, again, the, the Jews were scattered again and what we call the diaspora. Well, let's begin in verse 1. We see this uh, coming invasion. Uh, it's in verses 1 through 3. It says, Open your doors, O Lebanon, that a fire may feed on your cedars, and wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. Because of the glorious trees that have been destroyed, wail, O oaks of Bejan, for the impenetrable, impenetrable forest has come down. See these references you're seeing here to Lebanon, Bashan. It, it, it's a tableland uh, just above Gilead. It, it's northeast of the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful land. But when the enemy comes in, and, and we're going to see it tonight in one case, but they would always come in and destroy all the trees. They would cut them down. See, if they cut them down and left the land barren, they couldn't rebuild, they didn't have firewood, and they couldn't come against their enemies. And to cut down all the trees means that, again, the climate of the land would change. Again, so we see this, this picture, and it's mentioning these mighty oaks and the rich pasture land. And here is, it was great for... Uh, growing cattle, and you'll see elsewhere again the the cows of Bashan, and it just it was a rich, profitable land, and it meant a lot to the the rulers, these false shepherds, because they made a made a lot of money over it. But both of these regions were again had experienced a significant uh, deforestation, meaning that all the the trees were cut down, just as the prophet had said. While well, it was done in almost every major war, the Syrians, the Babylonians, and any of the other ones that would come in. And notice again, it speaks about the, the wail. Wail is not a language that you would think about where, where there's joy and there's peace. But it's a language of sorrow. See, the, the message in this text is that the, the best of the best they could ever imagine, when things are really going good, it's all coming down. It's all being destroyed. And these were these false shepherds. And, and when the loss is greater, the sorrow is greater. Notice with me in verse 3, and there is a, a sound, as again the shepherds wail, for their glory is ruined. There is a sound of the young lion's roar, and the pride of Jordan is ruined. And See, it, it, was, it was their wealth, as I mentioned, it had already come from here. It was their glory. It was their power. Everyone looked at this. Whoever controlled it, it, it seemed to be, it had a great statue in, in the eyes of everybody. Well, with the, the jungle tickets had been ruined, the shepherds, the rulers of that land, the officials, again, the, whoever would be the leaders of the land, and, God's bringing a retribution upon the land. God is judging. And God, remember, will never be mocked. You cannot continue to sin and sin and get away with it. You cannot rebel against God and expect that, that he's just going to turn a blind eye. No, this retribution that comes upon the land, it's, it's because of these wicked politicians. It's much like what we find in Many of the countries around the world, even in our own country, there are those wicked politicians. Again, they, they're lamenting over the loss, over the status that they have, their, their personal glory that they received, that they were in control of all these things. So they lament because it's all destroyed. It's all ruined. And for them, it means a great loss. Now notice again the, the cedars of Lebanon and 
the oaks of Bashan. These were, these were symbols of, of great power. You'll find it in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 13, and Ezekiel 31. Uh, you'll, you'll see these focused. And notice what it says in the text, verse 1, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, the prophet cries in verse 1. The doors of Lebanon, it, it speaks of those mountain passes that the enemy was going to, to come and approach the land, come into this land and, and, and destroy it. The invaders would come from the north and they would march forth. Howl is not the language of joy or, or even peace, but it's, again, it's a language of sorrow, great sorrow. Sometimes things can be going good and you just think you're getting away with it and God just doesn't, you know, God, God doesn't care. No, God cares. God's holy. God's just. God gives every person, every country a chance to repent. He finds no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. You see, he wants them all to repent and return back to him. Again, Zechariah did not name these new conquerors. He's not dropping names before us, but uh, briefly depicting again that the, the march is coming from the north. It kind of gives us an indication of what it may be, but we don't know for sure. They march, and it mentions this fertile land. It's on the, again, on the banks of the Jordan River. And they want the best of the best, and they're going to destroy it. Well, some say this is a prediction of Israel's devastation by Rome when they came in. The entire land would be ruined. The Lebanon, their great cedars, Bejant, the thick forest. Again, Israel's rich pastures, all destroyed. Everything they trust in. Let me ask the question, what is it that you trust in? Is it the material wealth, the things around us, our job, our boss, or is it God himself? We need to trust in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding. He will provide exactly what you need. He will give us the direction. Again, this, again, when they cut down the tree, when they destroy the, the pasture land, the, these were valuable resources in the land that offered so little to them anymore. Again, this modern state of Israel is reclaiming all that land. It's always been a credible thing going to Israel. You just see acres and acres of trees being planted just as the Bible said would be. And again, ancient invaders strategically targeted the farmland the pasture land, because, see, this would cripple the nation in a long-term way. See, the enemy always knows how to get to your place that would take you down, make you weak. Well, it's in verses 4 through 14. We see that crowning insult. Again, Zechariah receives a, a commission to be the, the shepherd, to go through the moves. Some say he's playing it out as a play, um, but he's telling this parable, this, this story. Some might liken it to an allegory, but it's explained through the rest of the Bible what it means. In this passage, God addresses Zechariah and told him, act out this parable. Many missions, when they go out, they, they will do like a play, like a skit. Sometimes you could call it a parable, and they'll do it because a picture speaks a thousand words. It's so easy for people to understand. So it's being played out before the people. So he represents in this picture the, the good shepherd anointed by God to, to care for his people. And this is in contrast to the false shepherds that we've been talking about as we go along. Sadly, sometimes people don't know the difference between a good shepherd and a false shepherd. And we're going to see tonight they had a choice and they rejected the good shepherd, the true shepherd. Well, the prophet, he assumes this role of the shepherd of the flock. Then this flock is destined for slaughter. Why? Because they reject their king. It's a picture. And that's how the Middle Eastern mind, it, it, it paints these pictures and they would talk in, in this way. Well, the leaders of this nation, that is, probably the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were hypocritical. We, we've seen it all through the New Testament. 
They were covetous. And, and that doesn't mean every Pharisee and every Sadducee, but for the most part, they were in it for the money, just as today there are pastors that are hirelings. The Bible talks about them. It's in verse 4 of our text. It says, thus says the Lord, my God, pastor the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them, slay them, and go unpunished. Each of those who sell them says, Blessed be the Lord, for I have become rich. And their own shepherds have no pity upon them. Now this is referring to these ungodly shepherd leaders. Uh, they wreak and havoc uh, on the individuals, the nations, and they're, they're selling the people of, as slaves. So again, Zacharias compared the the people to the sheep that are bought and sold in, in a marketplace. The, the buyers and sellers are Israel's foreign leaders. Sometimes even their own people who are wealthy would sell them. And you've seen people that are in our own culture that take advantage of people, manipulate people. It's been suggested again because the way the scripture plays out, it was possibly Rome, who ruled the nations for profit, for taxes, for wealth. Worse still, it's already mentioned, is, is really uh, Jerusalem's or the Jewish rulers, their own shepherds, who really didn't care for the people at all. When things get tight, they run. And they let the people suffer on their own. In Jesus' day, the, the Jewish civil rulers, leaders, like the Sadducees I mentioned, the Pharisees, often seem more interested in maintaining their position, their power, their status, and the riches and well-being than the populace. The moment that anyone in leadership, whether they're a pastor or they're an elder or a deacon, the moment we lose sight of the people, we're here to serve the people. We're here to lead people to Christ. We're here to, to minister his love, his grace. Well, notice again that there, there's a flock, but that flock is, as I mentioned already, is marked for slaughter. God, patient, long-suffering, giving every opportunity for people to repent, but sometimes they just won't do it. The temple kept extensive herds, and, and this was common in their, their area. And a lot of people argue about that, but they had to make sacrifices regularly. And, and these sheep, there would be lots of sheep in Bethlehem 12 months a year because they had to bring them daily into the temple. And when it got cold, it certainly they would go in the caves, but they had to be available. And they would have all these, again, shepherds, many shepherds, in fact, and they would watch over the temple, again, herds. And what's interesting to, to stop and think about as they sell and take advantage of manipulate and put things in their own pocket, it reminds us that any of us, when we sin and we think we're innocent, the depth of, again, of evil we've reached. So many people can justify their sin and yet they have chose to put blinders on. And this is what was happening of the, the leaders there. They couldn't see their own sin. All they could see was their, their greed, their desires. Verse 6 continues, For I no longer have pity upon the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. But behold, I will cause the men to fall, each into another's power, into the power of his king, and they will strike the land, and I will not deliver them from the power. See, this is a prediction that the judgment that is going to come upon him. And, and basically, when a person comes to the point of no return, and this is what he's saying about these are marked for slaughter, they've already decided they're, they're going to rebel, they're going to reject the king, and, and God says, I, I'm not going to have again any pity upon them. I'm going to let them go through everything. This is what they have chosen. See, much death comes to the Jews is really not just retribution to the land, but, but because of their own choices. 
You know, this is one of the most wonderful things that God has, has given us is a free will to choose or reject him. He's given us a mind to reason and know him and, and, and to follow him. He's given us emotions that we can love and receive his love. And that's always the hope that people would receive his love, acknowledge him for who he is, and, and choose to follow him with all their heart and mind and soul and strength. Well, some of this death comes upon them from their own people, killing others, taking advantage. And you always find that. Even in churches today, they're sometimes the bigger churches, it's easy to get lost. They're, they're there to fleece the flock, to take advantage, to manipulate looking for work, looking for weak women. And these are wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible teaches, again, that wheat and tear grow side by side. And that's surprising. It's not just for the church. It's, it's always been the nature. Well, there's a point here that what we're seeing is that God gives up on the people. He turns them over to be smitten by their own people. That is, they kill each other. Judgment is coming. And we're talking about surely your sin will find him out. And this is what's happening. They have brought the judgment upon themselves. It wasn't that the warning wasn't given. Yes, the warning had been given again and again. Well, next we're going to see really is the rejection. And again, the pictures of the Messiah. Messiah is pictured here as the, the good shepherd. Rejected again by ancient Israel, and, and, and many people, even in the world today, reject. They call themselves agnostics or atheists. And basically, they have to suppress the truth because, again, as we've been talking in our Wednesday class about Romans, God reveals in every person's heart there is a God, and that he is the God who revealed himself in creation. And God says they know. And they choose to suppress that truth. Well, look with me in verse 7 of our text. So I pastured the flock, this is Zechariah speaking, doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. I took for myself two staves, the one called favor, the other called union. So I pastured the flock. So Israel was beset with shepherds who had abused, as we mentioned, who had, had slaughtered the, the people, took advantage the picture is with the sheep, but it really the sheep represent the people. And we know that in the body of Christ that we are the, the sheep of his pasture. He's the, the good shepherd. And the good shepherd, again, his, his mercy, God the Father in his mercy has sent the good shepherd. He's come to seek and save the lost. He's come to, again, to die upon the cross for every man, not just elect, but every man. And we appropriate by faith. We believe and trust in him. And they have to desire to, to want to be protected. But sadly, they wanted nothing to do with them, even detested him. And that's what people do today when they, they either choose and receive him, appropriate by faith that salvation, or they reject him. They're either for him, the scripture says, or against him. There is no sitting on the fence. You're either for him or you're against him. Now, Zechariah obeyed the Lord's command to, to act uh, out the part of the good shepherd. The, that is the Messiah. This is the, the role that he's playing. It's, it's a living parable. The Hebrew word rendered oppressed in some translations means the the poor, or we saw in ours, the afflicted, the humble. The word probably denotes a, a, a godly remnant of believers at the Messiah's first event. And when you stop and think about it, who did Jesus minister to those that were downcast, afflicted? The scripture says he chose the foolish things of the world, not the wise. Now, it goes on, there's mentioned, notice two staffs again in our text as we're reading. Instead of one showing a, a great care for the, uh, for the sheep, there, there's these two staffs. The shepherd carried two staffs. And, and you can find that in, in Psalm 23, 4. 
a club was one of those that was likened to a staff, a club, again, to protect the sheep from the wild animals, another staff to support and even retrieve. If a sheep had fallen down, they would take the hook and pull it or separate it from something. They would use it in many ways to guide them. And, and again, Zechariah is living this out. Now, sadly, some of the rulers uh, uh, did not even appear to have staffs. They were just there, just for their own, to take advantage of the situation. Lindsay, a commentator, says the staffs were given as symbolic names, favor, which means beauty or grace or pleasantness and union, literally uh, bands or ties, or as some have likened it to a unity. One verse 8, it says, uh, I alienated these three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul also was weary of me. This describes again Israel was weary with Jesus because he wasn't, again, the Messiah they were looking for. He wasn't fulfilling their desires, what they wanted. They failed to realize what the scripture was saying. Now, this becomes a puzzling thing for many scholars. See, they, they try to find in history and place it here and there and, and all these different things that this ruler from Assyria or Babylon or that ruler or that ruler. And we're going to see it, it's possible it could be that, but there's nothing that any of them even agree on fulfilling that. But it could be that it represents, again, the false leadership that was in Israel at that time. See, his destruction of these three shepherds in one month, it's in verse 8. It's just a historical allusion, it's said. And there are so many different interpretations, but none of them can agree. It becomes clear that the passage unfolds, really, that it, the focus is upon the, the abused flock, the abused sheep, taking care of it. It's not upon the individuals, they're abused because they rejected the Messiah. They had the option, see, of receiving him or rejecting, and that's what they did. They rejected God's shepherd. And yet the Bible talks about the shepherd all through, and they should have been looking for and understanding that all the miracles were signs, signs that he was the Messiah, but they rejected because they wanted another kind of Messiah or another kind of God. People are doing the same thing today. My God wouldn't do that. And it's opposite of what the Bible even teaches. See, in rejecting God's shepherd, they rejected God's help and salvation. And they have rejected eternal life. And they will suffer in hell for all eternity. Well, this became true in some ways in 70 AD. This strife comes upon Jerusalem. They're destroyed. They're separated. They're oppressed. Jerusalem's destroyed. What they believed could never happen happened. And what's interesting, because when the battle is the Lord, the Lord doesn't intervene this time. Why does he come? Because they had come to the point of no return. You know there's a point of no return in your life and my life? That is before we're a believer. You'll either receive him or reject him. You, you can keep pushing him away, pushing him away, pushing him away, and pushing him away until finally God hardens your heart just like Pharaoh's heart. Again, we have to receive him. And if we don't receive him, we're rejecting him. Either we're for him or against him. And People have to make that choice. In reality, as you go through the scripture, there's only a, a remnant. So God didn't intervene, for they rejected his salvation, the free gift of salvation. They said, we will not have this man save us. Who will save you? You really need to decide that. Who is your Lord and Savior? If you closed your eyes tonight, where would you go? Where would you end up? See, people, you have a choice. And those that are listening tonight online, you have a choice. If you've never received the Lord, today is the day of salvation. 
for tomorrow may be too late. Again, in verse 9, it continues, and then I said, I will not pastor you. What is to die? Let it die. What is to be alienated? Let it be alienated. Let those who are left eat one another's flesh. Those are hard words. Eat one another's flesh. Wait a second. Isn't this a good book full of joy? It tells the truth, and sometimes the truth is very hard for people. See, after all the miracles and after all the wonderful teaching, the, the kind deeds, and Jesus fulfilling every one of those signs, the Messiah was still rejected as a nation. Rejected again, the, the, again, the leadership. Stop and think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They understood the scripture. And yet they chose not to accept, to reject. Again, so... What happens is the Messiah reject, re relinquished again. This is important. His position is this, this great shepherd. He's no longer going to guide them. He's no longer going to protect them. In fact, in Josephus, the Jewish historian records a shocking instance again in 70 AD in the city, the, the cannibalism that the people were eating one another. See, God had put in them, instilled eternity in their heart, and they're wanting to live. But because they rejected him, they couldn't turn. They wouldn't turn back. They wouldn't cry out. They wouldn't repent. They began to eat one another. And that took place uh, again during the Roman siege. In 70 AD, the city was destroyed. Now, it's in the Gospel, John chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. Let me read. It says, there was a true light which was coming in the world and enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who are his own did not receive him. Question is, when, whenever you hear the word of God, you either receive or reject Recently, I don't have a chance to look at Facebook often, but I happened to glance and look at some of the comments were made. And there was someone who, who commented something along this line, why do you believe this crazy, foolish stuff? You're stupid. He had rejected the truth. But you know what's interesting? Why he appears to reject the truth, he was listening to the message. And God's word doesn't come back void. He may receive the word later or he may harden his heart, but he is going to be without excuse. By his words, he rejected. My prayer is that he would listen and listen and open his heart up and say, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And God will reveal himself to him. So this true light, who is the Messiah, he's coming into the world. He enlightened every man's heart. He is the true light. Every man, again, I'm going to say is without excuse. I, I know this is New Testament. But he was still there. He came to his own. They saw the signs and all the wonders. But they rejected him. It's in verse 10, we see this covenant uh, annulled. And I took my staff favor, which means grace, and cut it in pieces to break my covenant, which I made with all the people. So it was broken that day and thus afflicted the flock who were watching me realize that it was the word of, Lord, word of the Lord and they finally caught it. There's a remnant to catch it. There's some that will just mock it. And I pray that would never be true of you or anyone that we know. See, Zechariah broke the staff, and when he did it, they saw, they understood he was giving this picture. God was breaking that covenant. And there was a remnant. When the time Jesus came, when he came to his own, they received him on. And the covenant was broken. They realized that he was the Messiah. And they received him as the Lord and Savior, while the bulk rejected him. They realized, again, this, this again, breaking this, this staff, this, this grace, this covenant they were, the divine blessing that was 
given there to protect them. The protection no longer rested on this nation and they could see it before their eyes being fulfilled just as you and I see scripture today sometimes being fulfilled in prophecy. But what will you do when you see it fulfilled? Will you live for him? Or just keep walking as you always do apart from him? See, as Zechariah symbolically attends the sheep, his, his care is particularly, again, and you think about this and compare it to Jesus' life, was, was to the oppressed. Those afflicted, those who were suffering, those who recognized the, the word of the Lord. There were those that wanted to hear the word of God. You know, when I got saved, I, I, I wanted to hear the word of God, but I had a hard time reading and I never, never knew the, the, the word of God. I had a hard time reading it. And I had to look up every word. But I said, God, give me a hunger and thirst that I, I will read your word. And that's God's will. And anything you pray according to his will, he will answer that for you and me. Well, for Zechariah, again, being fulfilled, he was, again, giving this picture of the, the Messiah would come, the good shepherd that would come. It's interesting. There was a small amount, a remnant, a despised minority, but they acknowledged him. The people that most people would have laughed at and mocked at, but those were the ones that acknowledged him. Those were the ones that recognized they need him. Let me read kind of a a long passage and away from Matthew 23. It's verses 34 to 35. It begins this way. Therefore, behold, I'm sending you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon them you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who was murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you all the things which come upon this generation. And he goes on in verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. The way a hen gathers her chicks from under her wings. But you are unwilling. Behold, your house is being left desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That last phrase is when Jesus returns, the Jewish people acknowledge him. These would be the very words that they say. Rejected at that first coming. But he's still coming again. He's coming in judgment the second time. But there will be those who recognize him. A remnant. And you can see all the abuse. And you, and you, uh, that how they abuse the prophets. But, but in verse 37, you, you see really the heart. How God wanted to gather him as a, a mother hen. Gathers her chicks under her wings. He knew in advance. He still went through the moves, giving every opportunity for people to respond. Again, if you haven't responded tonight to him and you're watching online or wherever you may be, you may not have another opportunity. There was a man in our fellowship. We were doing a baptism. And I asked, is there anyone else that wants to be baptized? The man stripped down to his underwear, walked down to the water. He says, I'm sorry, but I may not have another chance ever to be baptized. I want to honor God. And shortly after, he passed away. So I may look at that in a negative way. I look at it that he knew. Today was the day he was going to honor God. Will you honor God? That's my question for you, for me. Well, in verses 12 and 13 contain, again, some of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible. 
The Messiah had been rejected. The nations, again, shepherd. Again, so was asked for his severance pay. It's going to be the, the throwing away of the, the silver coins. So let me read it first from Matthew 27, verse 3 and 5. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, one of the twelve, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse. And he returned 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I have sinned and betrayed innocent blood. But they said, what is this to us? See the heartlessness of them? They had already determined what they were going to do. See to it that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary, departed, and he went away and hanged himself. It was something very, even more sad than the story itself. He never confessed to God. There's nothing in the scripture that says that. Nothing he repented. He only had remorse. Remorse is sorry. As many people have been in prison, they're sorry when they get out what had happened, but they go and do it again. That's not repentance. Well, again, in verse 14, it says, Then I will cut in pieces my second staff union to break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. See, the breaking of the second staff, that's union, has been interpreted really to signify the, the eternal strife that was between the, the north and the, the south, Judah and Israel, the two divisions. God wanted to bring them back together. Verse 15 continues, And the Lord said to me, Take again your, to yourself the equipment of a, a foolish shepherd this time. Again, Zechariah has played this part of the Messiah, the good shepherd, and, and now the Lord instructs him to act as this, this other kind of shepherd, this foolish shepherd, the evil one. See, people must have leaders. Oh, they, they want to rule themselves, but really they always gravitate. There's always somebody that's raised up. God's made it that way. They're believers, but godly men... People will argue over what type of leadership should you have, this kind of or that kind of. You know, the only thing that's really important is you have godly leaders. Men that seek God, men that want to honor God, men want to follow God, men that want to lead you in the presence of God. Well, Zachariah is playing the part of the evil one now. Again, if the loving Messiah is rejected, other leaders are, who are so kind will fill the void. No, no, they, they need an evil one because the people like darkness more than light. See, the word again evidently refers back to verse 7 where the prophet put on the tire and gear and including the two staffs, the shepherd act as a, in this drama the addition of the staffs, the equipment, shepherds, whether it's good or bad, include all these items, a, a bag for food, a pipe for calling the sheep, a knife. But the word foolish speaks of one who is morally evil, despises wisdom and discipline. And yet we see that so often. We hear of that so often from the pulpit. Proverbs 1, 7 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. They're looking for the wisdom. So many are looking for the wisdom of the world, but they're not looking for the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is Jesus Christ himself as well. It's in verse 16. Notice with me in our text. For behold, I'm going to raise up, notice a shepherd in the land who will not care for the perishing, Seek the scattered, or heal the broken, or sustain the one standing, but will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hoofs. This is the false shepherd. This is the antichrist. If a person rejects the true Christ, the true Messiah, they will receive the false, the evil one. Notice it's God himself that raises up this leader. As a judgment of the nation, rejecting the Messiah... God will raise this one up. The foolish shepherd cares not for the sheep, but only for himself. And you know, if you watch a shepherd long enough, you'll see whether he really cares for the flock, if he cares for the people, or he's only concerned about himself. 
if they lose their way, even the little ones, he, he doesn't seek after them is what the scripture is saying. He's, it's only about himself, only about people acknowledging, patting him on the back. Ministry sometimes is a very quiet thing. Oh, you get a lot of hypocrisy from time to time. But the only words that really matter are those words, good and faithful servant from God himself. Look with me in verse 17 in our text. It says, woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. This is what the evil shepherd does. A sword will be on his arm. And on his right eye, his arm will be totally withered. And his right eye will be blind. See, Israel had rejected the good shepherd that would have provided exactly what they needed. There was a immediate consequences, though, for their choices. They would suffer. The big consequence is really this antichrist, the one instead of, the one wanting to be, who would exercise again uh, this terrible power during, again, the, the tribulation. And you can find that in Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 13, pictures that. In fact, again, he is spiritually foolish again in our text tonight in verse 15. And, and also in verse 17, he is, again, a worthless shepherd. It will be a time of incredible hardship and suffering for Israel until God judges this final shepherd. That will only be, only happen when that tribulation comes. For us, what's important is we need to stay in relationship with God. We need to draw close to him. He's the one that will fight the battles. He's the one that we need to follow with all of our heart and all of our mind and soul and strength and love him that way. And learn to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The only, the only cure, the only hope for you and me is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Oh, Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have that you're coming soon. Thank you that we have the assurance that we are kept by your power, not our own power. We can walk not by our wisdom, but your wisdom. We can be guided. Those footsteps by you leading and guiding us. Lord, we thank you for what lays ahead, knowing that all things are in your hands. Lord, we pray for those right now that do not know you. Lord, open their hearts tonight that they want to know you, want to acknowledge you as their Lord and Savior and give their lives completely to you to, to have the hope that we have that the world doesn't have. God, draw them in to your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Yes, what uh, Ron was sharing, we all go through that. We all went through that. We all said those things. But for those who are still looking and searching and even mocking, when you're saved, there's a peace, such a peace. Knowing that one day all this will all pass and we go home to be with the Lord. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say. That it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed Victory is won 
He is risen from the dead And I will rise When he calls my name No more sorrow No more pain I will rise On eagle's wings Before my God Fall on my knees And rise I will rise There's a day that's drawing when the darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear And my faith shall be my eye Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won He has risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrow No more pain I will rise On the eagle's wings Before my God Fall on my knees and rise I will rise And I hear the voice of many angels sing Worthy is the Lamb And I hear the cry of every longing heart Worthy is the land And I hear the voice Of many angels sing Worthy is the land And I hear the cry Of every longing heart Worthy is the land I hear the voice of many angels sing Worthy is the Lamb And I hear the cry of every longing heart Worthy is the Lamb I will rise when He calls my no more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on the eagle's wings Before my God fall on my knees I will rise, I will rise There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say that it is well I really didn't tell you tonight how to be saved. John 3.16 it says, whosoever believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe means to trust him completely, what he's done upon the cross. He was raised from the third day. He's conquered death. Romans talks about if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart. You're saved. That word saved is past tense. It's something that's done. Well, how do I know I'm saved? You'll have new desires in your heart that you never had before. You'll want to worship him. You'll want to read his word. you want to be around other believers. They're like-minded. You'll find that everything is changing in your life. Those things that you used to do 
you're not doing. It doesn't mean you're perfect because we're still working through this life. But his spirit again will testify with your spirit that you're saved and you're going to be with him for eternity. And you want to be in the fellowship of other believers. You want to be around them, studying, encouraging. You want to tell others about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in your life. And as the scriptures say, you might say, I was blind, but now I see. The choice is yours. You'll receive him or you'll reject him. You can do it in the privacy or home. You can do it here online. But please, receive him as your Lord and Savior. Father, I pray if there's anyone that is struggling with that decision, increase Give them the faith to believe and trust. Surround them with loving brothers and sisters who will disciple them and nurture them and help them grow in your love and your grace. Thank you, Lord, that we're still allowed to open your word, to read it, to study it, to encourage. And we pray, Lord, for your kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful night in the Lord.